So welcome to Stories on Stage, Sacramento. Thank you all for being here on a historic night for Sacramento and other reasons, for other reasons, you filled a literary event. <laughs> so give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> My name is Josh Velasky. I'm the artistic director here at Stories on Stage, Sacramento. So again, welcome to everyone. How many of you are first timers to our events? <laughs> no offense, long timers, we love you. <laughs> How many of you are long timers to our events? Yay! Now, first timers, you need to get to there. <laughs> Come back, see us again. Um, so, a few housekeeping issues that we need to take care of are the emergency exits in case this is such a raging party that uh, we all have to escape. There are doors back out to the parking lot right here. So just calmly, calm, like we have a fire chief in the house, um, so don't embarrass us. Um, but yes, right out there will get you to safety. Back out the way you came will also get you to safety. The bathrooms, Joella, one of our wonderful volunteers, I think told everyone on the way in, they're in the back of the house, there are two of them, they're unisex, just form long lines, that's what usually happens here. Because um, they're, they're right in the back of the house. Uh, please turn off your electronic devices. Now, we don't need any updates on what's happening at Golden One. Do not ruin it for me, it's being recorded. I'm wearing old King's blue, this is how long I've been waiting. Uh, when I was a child, this is what we wore. This purple stuff is awesome, but the hideousness of the 80s is back. Uh, I guess everyone who was gonna take a survey took a survey because the survey people, I saw them in the parking lot, leaving. So you guys did a good job. Um, nice work on getting more money to the arts in Sacramento County. That's what it was about. So hopefully you guys said nice things. I don't know what the survey said. Uh, our bookseller, Capital Books, we thank them. They are the best. Also, they're on K Street. That's where their physical store is. Go in and spend money um, on a rainy day or a sunny day uh, if you're ever in that neighborhood. We also are known for our free cookies. Many of you saw them. I hope partook of them on the way in. Those are provided by our former director and still board members to staff, so thank you for that. We have other former directors in the house, Dorothy Rice and Valerie Fiorvanti. This is a Where's Waldo issue, so just ask. Just, if somebody looks writerly, just like, are you Valerie? Um, Valerie um, looks very writerly. Valerie just pointed herself out. I was not going to be a jerk from up here, but she did it. So Valerie's right there talking to her about writing. Our, the rest of our season, we have former director's nights. So you actually get to hear the writing of these amazing women in June. So Valerie and Dorothy and Sue and Shelley. Um, who's actually right now hosting a King's party because you can like basketball and literature. <laughs> we have a volunteers night, so all the lovely people who helped you on the way in, their writing will be featured in September. And then because Friday the 13th is on, is in October this year, we're having a horror night because it's Friday the 13th in October. What else are we gonna do? Um, so talk to anyone in his shirt. But that's true. Anyone in his, please don't flash. Anyone in stories on stage shirt. So the executive director, Jessica Lasky, is in the back. She also has a shirt on. Um, and then any of the lovely volunteers that you talk to on the way in. And otherwise, Stories on Stage, along with the Chills of Will podcast, is very pleased to bring you the very first Literary Deathmatch Sacramento. <laughs> Hello, cherished friends and tolerated acquaintances. This disembodied voice is here to welcome you to what will be the night of all of our lives. No one can see me, so this is great. And now, the man the Los Angeles Times called a bug-eyed, whip-it-thin literary P.T. Barnum. Put your hands together for your host, Adrian Todd Zaniga. First time in my life, this is an incredible.
wonderful place. And I'm more thrilled to welcome you to Literary Deathmatch Sacramento episode one! <laughs> microphone is on. Is it on? Yeah. Great! That one seemed loud, this one seems quiet, and I'm loud, so this is perfect. That one was not perfect. Okay, uh, tonight I wanted to open talking about salons. I'm kind of obsessed. Something happened <laughs> for the last couple years, but it feels like we're gravitating towards a, a normalcy, um, and I just want people, I basically want like weirdo, smart, uh, coffee-loving people to get together on sort of a, a weekly-ish, monthly-ish basis. Um, so I'm promoting the salon. And the reason I even bring it up is because from 1919 to 1929, uh, the Algonquin Roundtable got together every day sir, uh, for 10 years. And that group of people, has anybody ever heard of the Algonquin Roundtable? Yeah. Yeah. Smart, cool nerds, I love it. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, it was a group, uh, a collected group of wits, writers, producers, actors, just like geniuses, effectively. And so they got together every day for 10 years, which again is absurd. Um, and like the members included uh, Marco, uh, Marco Harps. He's a little known uh, Harps brother, but it's actually Harpo Marx. <laughs> actress Tulula Bankhead, the playwright Noel Coward, but the, the brightest star of that group was the one and only Dorothy Parker. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about her tonight, because she was incredible. She was a genius of quips, one of the most quotable people in American history. And uh, to give you a sense, she said, when I wake up every morning, I brush my teeth, and sharpen my tongue. And that tongue sharpening, that tongue sharpening started when she was four years old. When she was four years old, her, her mother had passed, her father got remarried, and she refused to call her stepmother anything other than the housekeeper. <laughs> she was brutal. I mean, she was four. Uh, and uh, then came her university years, uh, in which she said, if all the girls attending the Yale prom were laid end to end, I wouldn't be at all surprised. <laughs> she crushed. Uh, she later developed her take on the opposite sex. She said, I require three things in a man. He must be handsome, ruthless, and stupid. <laughs> she dominated. Um, she, this one I shouldn't say because my fiance always says it's not funny and don't tell people, but she's not here to stop me. She called, uh, Wait, oh fuck, palm trees, yes. She called palm trees the ugliest vegetable that God created. I didn't even put that in my notes, because yeah, thank you for the, the pity laugh I, I enjoyed. Uh, but of all her quotes, the one I want to like sweep through Sacramento, I want to come back next year, and I want to like, I want to overhear it at a cafe. And uh, this is the quote. She said, uh, this would be when she was invited to a party she didn't want to go to. She would say, I am too fucking busy and vice versa. <laughs> uh, I want to overhear that. Um, but uh, obviously, if you're going to start a salon based on this show, you're like, okay, we're going to do it. He, he willed it into existence. We're going to we're going to take that up. Uh, Dorothy Parker's a pretty high bar. So I did want to tell you about another member of uh, the Algonquin Roundtable, um, which was a woman named uh, Edna Ferber. And she wrote the 1925 novel So Big, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And she was amazing. She used to wear finely tailored suits, uh, pants and all. Um, I now wear, and this is what I call the Edna Ferber suit. Uh, purple for the kings, but uh, well cut for Edna Ferber. Um, so one time she was arriving to the Algon Algonquin Hotel to hang with everyone, as they called it. And she saw playwright and actor Noel Coward coming from the other way. Um, you'll know him from the Italian job. And uh, he saw the way she was dressed, and he was dressed very similarly. And she said, Edna, or he said, Edna, you look almost like a man. And she said, so do you. <laughs> anyway, so when the uh, thing the Butter Round Table starts, just let me know, email me. Uh, that's, you know, I just wanted you guys to know about that. Okay. Literary Deathmatch. Uh, just a little history. This is the 73rd city we've done the show in, which is too many cities, quite frankly, for it to take us this long to get here, so apologies from us. Uh, we've done it 537 times. Hopefully this will be the 538th. So far, we've, we've finished every show we started. But this could get so mental. You're, you're gonna be so blown away by everybody. You're just gonna be like, ah, we're gonna tear out the emergency doors. Uh, but try not to, because when the show ends, you'll go, 
ah, oh, that's what was happening the whole time. It'll all make sense. Um, so here's how the show works. We have four incredible writers. They're gonna read their own work for five minutes or less. Uh, if they go over time, I'm gonna drop this flask on the floor, it'll make a banging sound. If you go 30 seconds over, I'll drop it twice. At six minutes, I'll drop it three times. They won't hear any of this. They're gonna be so zoned in. But uh, if they go too long, then I'll, I'll get everybody to cheer them off. Because ultimately, we just wanna run out of here uh, like our hair's on fire to buy books. So I understand that's what you really want. Uh, so we'll just try to keep it moving that way. Uh, we've got a special event in the middle of the show, which I'll get to later. Um, and then uh, after the readers read, two in the first round, the judges will say lovely, strange things about each of them. We have three all-star judges in the categories of literary merit, performance, and intangibles. So they're gonna pick one of those two to go to the finals. Then we're gonna have a little interstitial. Then in the second round, we're gonna have two other readers. We read, judge a judge, lovely strangeness, and then they're gonna pick one of those. And then it ends in a vaguely literary game to decide the winner. We haven't done this finale in seven years. I brought it back for you, and you'll basically just be screaming with glee by the end. <laughs> Some of you are gonna be like, I've gone insane, I'm having too much fun. But we'll see how it, how it goes. If none of that makes sense, um, Michael C. Hall of Dexter fame, he's judged the show a couple times in LA, he called it a highbrow, lowbrow literary game show clusterfuck. So that's <laughs> basically what you're gonna see. Uh, if you use social media, you can find us on there. Nobody cares. Okay. Okay. Step right here. This screen, you're like, what is this screen for? I'm not gonna tell you yet, because I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I know it's here, and it'll all work out great. Uh, it's time to introduce the judges. Who's ready for the judges? <laughs> Pete is our uh, strong man. He'll make more sense as the show, but he opens as the strong man. Um, anyway, judging literary merit. He's the president of Sacramento State University, a Pushcart prize-winning writer, a literacy champion award winner from the South Texas Literacy Co Coalition. He was named the 2022 Champion of the Year by Sacramento Black Chamber of Commerce. Put your hands together for the one and only Robert E. Nelson. <laughs> judging performance. She's an award-winning journalist, the host of Insight on Capital Public Radio, and she's won two regional Emmys and a regional Edward R. Murrow for the documentary Return to Paradise. Get up for Vicky Gonzalez! <laughs> and judging intangible, she's an actress, reporter, and spokesman at SAC Cultural Hub, along with being an event MC, it's the one, the only, Nakisha Henry! <laughs> Robert, I uh, put that one microphone rudely on the stage, as opposed to in, the, in the, what I call the holster for some reason. I was just in Texas, so uh, you know. So anyway, I wanted to ask each of you a question uh, to get the audience to know you better before we bring up our first round readers. Robert, Joan Didion was an amazing cook, and many of her recipes were written by hand. Her most audacious recipe was a parsley salad to feed 35 to 40. Weird. I wonder what's the weirdest thing you've cooked, or wildest thing you've cooked, and how many does it feed? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know, I never liked Joan Didion, but I'm supposed to love her because I'm from New York, Sacramento now, so. Um, when I met her, she was uh, pretty rude. So, um, I probably, the, um, I used to cook for the students uh, at uh, UT Dallas um, when I was uh, the head of the creative writing program. And so we do these huge uh, gazpacho uh, for them and feed about, I don't know, 120 or depending upon how drunk they were. <laughs> so, there were a lot of them and, you know, and sometimes we fell down from drinking too much to walk up. Give it up for Robert S. Nelson. <laughs> Christie wrote two books a year, one year writing seven. Seven, that's insane. 
Uh, because of that, she said, I'm a sausage machine, a perfect sausage machine. <laughs> I mean, what a cell phone. Uh, as someone who's quite prolific, I wondered what food would you use to describe your work ethic? <laughs> wow, okay. Um, huh. You know, so my favorite food to make, and actually when you do it well, it, it takes it takes a while, and it's you can do like, you know, the box version, but I love making mac and cheese. It's very comforting, it's nourishing. It takes a lot of time if you want to do it right. There's a lot of ingredients, because I like to add a lot of ingredients to my mac and cheese. So I'm gonna call it a mac and cheese. I love it, give it up for Vicki Gonzalez. When E.B. White recorded his audiobook for Charlotte's Web, he kept breaking down, and it took him 17 takes to record the death scene. It's such a moving, beautiful moment in literary, literary history. And I wonder, what's the most impressed you've ever been with your own work? <laughs> well, I will tell you this. If anything takes me 17 tries, I'm not going to be impressed at all. <laughs> I'm going to be embarrassed and pissed at myself that it took that many times. Um, this may sound cliche, but honestly, my best work are my two sons. <laughs> um, and a lot of people look at me and think, oh, you have an eight-year-old? My oldest is 24, my youngest is 21. And they are thriving in California, which is very, very hard for our young adults to do, and to see them working and just being able to uh, provide for themselves and just be the great young black men that I raised them to be, I think that's my best work right there. <laughs> We're going to bring out our first round readers. She's the author of the memoir, Burnt, a memoir of fighting fire. She started firefighting in California at 17 and was promoted up the ranks to become the state's first and only female chief of fire protection. Get wild for Claire Frank. Come on up. <laughs> Sacramento, Claire's opponent, a Sacramento-based director and playwright. Get ready, get set for Anthony Juan! Anthony! Yeah. Uh, first, I'm going to do a coin flip. Uh, Anthony, uh, because it confused you when I explained, as it confuses everyone, I'm going to have you call the coin flip in the air. Uh, so I'm going to say two author-on-author author insults, and then you tell me which one will land hits. Uh, first up. Alexand Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this about Gore Vidal. He is a bad novelist and a fool. The combination usually makes for great popularity in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> that goes over real well in Australia. Right? <laughs> okay, and Lord Byron's nickname for William Wordsworth was William Turdsworth. <laughs> I mean, you gotta love the low hanging fruit. Okay. Tales, he says. Appreciated that he waited it for to land, waited for it to land, and he is right. It is Tales. Um, Anthony, would you like to read first or second? Second. Second. Look at the gamesmanship. That's uh, totally fine. So Anthony is going off the stage as I am, and then we are going to hear from Claire Frank for five minutes. Last year, for Claire Frank. setting run 
burning a squat of 50,000 acres in a single afternoon. Back when I was on an engine, it took fires weeks to burn that many acres. Two days later, lightning strikes once again pelted Northern California, and a different arsonist started a fire near the Oregon border, which ripped into the city of weed, threatening homes, schools, and businesses. They needed aircraft reinforcement, so we diverted air tankers and helicopters away from the more remote King Fire. The King Fire took advantage and raced toward the triathlon space, and other fires in California and neighboring western states kept the looting resource availability. We were running out of everything. We're drawdown on command teams, I told Ken, meaning I deployed our last available team for running large-scale incidents. His face fell. We have to go out of state for the King Fire. Ken winced, then nodded. Most out-of-state teams were not as hyperactive as ours. We moved fast because we knew the next fire was coming, and we had to treat summer like a game of whack-a-mole. Teams from other parts of the country operated with less urgency. I'd seen it last two years ago. The incident commander on a team that came out west to help with a massive fire near Yosemite told us at the transition briefing, y'all out here move fast. <laughs> I made the calls. At this point, we gratefully accept any help anyone could give. The approaching triathlon kept us spinning and the governor's office now wanted an in-person briefing. Mostly, he wanted to see the fire maps. The King's record-setting afternoon had given the fire an undeniable phallic shape. <laughs> Maybe we should hang it sideways, make it less obvious. <laughs> My staff chief offered. No, North always goes on top. <laughs> I hung the map on the wall in its proper orientation. The fire perimeter formed a full-on erection. <laughs> with testicles sagging at the bottom, near the origin. And we're still two spot fires sparted just ahead of the tip. <laughs> the dignitaries arrived and no one mentioned it at first. <laughs> Then one of the governor's staff said, Is it just me or does that look like? Nope. Nobody else sees that. It's just you, you're depraved. It broke the ice. But still, Ken used a pointer instead of his fingers. He traced a line showing the record books. science voice, this is attributable to how dry the fuel is and how quickly it can burn based on what we call the energy release component. Someone started church laughing. <laughs> then a bunch of people did. Then someone said, is that what it's called these days? <laughs> and then no one could hold it in. And the top leaders of the sixth largest economy in the world <laughs> were lost in a spiral of penis jokes. <laughs> showed Cassie Myers leaving Chicago Fire with her co-worker Vanessa at the end of their shift. The two women arrived to their vehicles when Cassie realized she'd forgotten her tips and went back to the restaurant alone to retrieve them. Vanessa got in her car and drove off. 
Erica Calloway sat at her desk watching the news story on Cassie Myers, who was taken in a white van and driven north on I-5. The anchor said the following, unable to wait a day for her tips, Cassie Myers went back into the restaurant alone, hell-bent on retrieving a measly few dollars, and upon her return to her vehicle, she was taken. Erica turned, turned the sound off in disgust at the hint of blame the victim in the narrative. Cassie is 19 and her parents don't provide a credit card, they provide a roof, and that roof's in Sacramento. Cassie's job is in Elk Grove, so it's 15 minutes both ways. So yes, of course, without hesitation, Cassie marched herself back into that restaurant last night to get her tips hell-bent on those measly few dollars because that tip money is gas money, and she's back tomorrow at three. Erica stared at the soundless screen, pissed off until the knock at the front door snapped her back into the present. It was Angela Scott. She, she called Erica last night at nine o'clock and asked for a 7.30 appointment. Erica opened the front door and Angela stood there with a the travel mug of iced coffee, devoid of stress, as though she didn't believe in it. This made Erica curious since desperation and vengeance live behind the eyes of her normal clients. People don't call a legal investigation service because they found Christ. They call because they found hell and don't have time, money, and patience to try faith. They shook hands and Angela apologized for the, late, for the late call, but thanked Erica for her audacity. Erica thanked Angela for, their, for her firm grip and shut the front door and led her to the home office in the dining room. Erica was kicked out of her commercial space after the pandemic when management said they were renovating. Now it's territory as a group, is, is now, the te now it's territory to a group of folks who claimed the building and formed a private society complete with politics and hierarchy. They have 24-hour armed guards, and it's been said they gather and worship and use the local possums for sacrificial offerings. <laughs> Angela sipped her iced coffee and searched her phone. She pulled up a photo of Stephen and laid her phone on the table, then found a stick of cinnamon gum in her purse and began to chew it with, while the cannabis in her coffee calmed her as Erica looked at the picture of Stephen. Stephen was 40 years old, skinny, average, harmless type, with eyes that don't lie. Some might call him meek. Erica listened, to Angela, listened as Angela told the story. He came home after happy hour, around 7.30, and we had dinner. Then he gave our son a bath and put him to bed. Then we poured a glass of wine and sat and watched TV. I got up on, I got up on a commercial to go pee, and when I came back, he was gone. It's like he opened the door when I flushed and closed it when I washed my hands. He left his car, wallet, keys, no social media, no bank activity for nine months. Our son, Austin, is two. I want to be able to give him an honest answer when he's asking what happened to his dad. If he's dead, there's closure. If he's alive, then he's exactly where he belongs. Erica agreed to take the job, and then she wrote a note. The child bound them. Angela laid an envelope full of cash on the table and said, I've always wanted to hire a PI. Then she smiled and they shook hands and Erica said she'd be in touch by Friday and then Angela left. Erica looked at the cash in the envelope that teased a peak like a music box full of devils. She looked again at Stephen's picture. It was taken at a dive bar that looked familiar. She'd been drunk there before. The name of the bar escaped her. We're going to go to our judges. We're going to start with Robert speaking about Claire's literary merit. With the microphone. <laughs> I'll figure this out. Well, I thought we were going to start out with new journalism. Okay. Uh, new journalism came about in the in the eighties and seventies, uh, eighties and took over New York and everything else. And it sounded like we were gonna have new journalism, but suddenly it got phallic. <laughs> and we were in ancient Greece. <laughs> and watching the fire grow and grow and grow, and it even became more of ancient Greece as we were looking there. The irony of the kings, 
tonight? Okay. The King's Fire, did you plan that? Did you, were you the arsonist? All for tonight. Anyways, I'm glad that we're here in uh, Sacramento because I will buy your book and I'll put it in the library at Sac State. <laughs> Why? Because I know if we were in Florida, it would be burned tonight. <laughs> well, uh, Claire, I love the firefighter on top and the writer on the bottom. Having uh, covered countless wildfires myself, I mean, just the fact that you were able to transport everyone there, the really the value of your pauses when you were talking. And I love that you were able to encapsulate really the gravity of, of what you and other firefighters endured in the community, but also the humor that comes along with doing it day in and day out. And, you know, I guess the climax at the end was really... <laughs> the intangibles, the fun part. So um, you have, first of all, a very commanding presence, Claire. Like, you just came right up here. You're just a badass. I mean, it's talking about how you were battling the lightning, the fire, and saving the triathlon site, you're just a true badass. And I thought this was gonna be a heroic, which it was, but then, like Robert said, start turning a little ancient Greece. So with that, I wanna say, it really made me think, and I, you know, I, I'm a fan of karaoke, so I'm gonna, I have a song that came to mind as you were talking about this fire, and that was none other than Rick James and Tina Marie. Fire and desire, baby. You did that, girl, good job. <laughs> Anthony, crime. You're a crime novelist. And it wasn't a crime what you wrote. In fact, I would like to meet Erica, but more than anything, you use that toilet better than I've ever seen anybody use a toilet in my life. The timing for the opening and the closing. How did you get that timing so perfect? Erica was at the door and everything. The, had to pee? That was absolutely brilliant. It's what I used to try to teach my students. If you get an object that everyone will remember, and every time I think of you in the future, <laughs> I'll think of you in that toilet. And that is great literature. Well, when it comes to performance, first nice drip, I really like your shoes. So hats off to that. Um, your shirt really matches the intensity that you brought with, with your performance. I really appreciated the weight that you gave your performance. You could feel the urgency and the intensity and you could, you did your as toilet included, so descriptive, you really transported us there. And my heart, the pace picked up, watching you and listening to you, and so you did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Thank you for All right, Anthony, the first thing I thought as you started reading was, damn, he got a strong diaphragm. I mean, the way you emphasize every syllable, every breath, it was just like, that's what built the suspense. So kudos to your diaphragm for that. And then also too, as I was sitting here and I'm like, I'm looking at your iPad, I was very impressed. Those words were so small and you were just scrolling through effortlessly, being able to read all that. I said, I couldn't even, yeah, if my life depended on it, I would die if I had to read what was on that iPad. You did a hell of a job with all of that. 
And for me, the song that comes to mind, kind of piggybacking off of what 50 said, the Jays, we gotta give it up for the Jordans. So ain't nobody don't pass me. I'm just so fresh, so clean. Hey, y'all give it up for Anthony. Huddle amongst themselves and decide which of these incredible writers will advance to the finals. Uh, impossible decision number one to be made soon. Uh, but yeah, triangulate, circle, I don't know how you guys are going to do it, but uh, some movement will help. Okay, there we go. If you want to say it over, give it up for Claire and Anthony. What a round! Yeah. Uh, I can tell you, I made the mistake of going on the internet recently, and I, because of this, I was like, oh, I'm just going to put some authors' names into UrbanDictionary.com because I want to see what the incels are saying, I guess. It's a bad choice. But I wanted to read a couple out. Uh, I also went to Amazon and read some one-star book reviews, another mistake. Uh, but here's, there is a positive one. This one was uh, from Mark Twain. A man who came up with approximately 50% of all quotes used today. <laughs> and then they cite, um, let there be light, which is tagged God famously quoting Mark Twain. So that was a fun one. <laughs> For Mary Shelley, there was author of the widely renowned Frankenstein and many other pointless works of literature. That's renowned spelled with a U. So I think we can trust them. Then um, Alexander Dumas, a really cool dude. He was like Batman. Um, that's actually my fiance. She said, uh, that's what she said about Alexander Dumas. And she said, oh, that'll be an urban dictionary. And then I mentioned the incel nature. Um, and then, uh, I won't get to the one story on the book reviews now, but uh, finally, there's, this is my personal favorite. And this was uh, for Charles Dickens. Rap word for penis, used when useful for rhyming, rarely used. So rare, in fact, it was used once, and it was on uh, the notorious, oh, sorry, it was Method Man from Notorious B.I.G.'s The What, and he said, assume the position, stop looking, listen, I spit on your grave, then I grab my Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> it's a real spit in the face with the thing, but uh, uh, not necessarily necessary. Um, okay, we're going to go to the judges. Has, has one of you elected to uh, announce the night's first finalist, or should I pick you from a group of Nikisha and Nikisha. Okay, uh, Robert, you can hand the microphone to Nikisha. She's gonna say a few words. Everybody in the audience will hold I, I hope she answer. will sing the winner, okay? Very well, Robert, I sing the winner. Okay, um, well, we, we picked this author because we just felt they were able to um, intertwine the seriousness of the content as well as um, the joking matter of the content, and it was such a great left turn that I think no one was expecting. Um, we certainly weren't expecting it, and I think we kind of speak for, well, we do speak for everybody else because we got the mic. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I'm not going to keep building the suspense. Um, we have chosen Claire. Give it up! <laughs> Uh, in Sacramento lives a person who brought this show here effectively. Uh, there's a man named Peter Real. I'm going to bring him up. Peter, if you could make your way to the stage. He's, uh, he's going to interview some folks. He does a Chills and Wills podcast, which we're all going to su subscribe to tonight. And it'll, you know, how great would that be for everyone uh, to have subscribers and all that? Uh, Peter, first, we're, I'm going to have you stand there as we uh, get the judges off the stage ever so gently. Um, but yeah, he interviews authors, so we thought it would be fun to bring up the four authors doing the show tonight. Just going to ask him one question, and then like a really fun, quick question, and then uh, we're all going to be entertained. If you do need to get a cookie, because that's what I'm going to go do if you want, uh, you can raise your hand, maybe I'll bring you one, uh, or use the bathroom. That's totally fine, just like during the show, we allow cookies and bathroom breaks. Um, but if I could have uh, Pete come on up and take on the mic for a good 10 minutes, let's see what happens! Chills of Will podcast. I've had um, Christian Kiefer, who's a Sacramento writer, uh, as well as Jamil John Kochai, uh, who's an incredible young writer as well. Not that Christian isn't young. Sorry about that, Christian. You know. uh, anyone from Jeff Perlman to Disha Filia to um, Ingrid Rojas Contreras, John Fernandez all kinds of writers that I've just been incredibly honored and privileged to talk to. 
COVID hit at the right time um, for Zoom, unfortunately, unfortunately, right? And so I've done all of them through Zoom. I've been, it's been an absolute um, privilege and it's so surreal to be able to talk to some of these folks, including um, these authors today. Um, so it's just an honor to be here. And I have a couple questions for, for the folks, and I'm gonna start with Naomi. Well, let's bring them on stage, right? If you guys Please. bring it up on stage, there's okay. yeah, chairs, come on so you can up. fight for the fourth. Oh, no, Claire is gonna bring up a fourth chair. Thank you, Mary. How about a round of applause for this incredible time? I think, can anybody help me out with me? Medical doing? So, so Naomi, I want to start with you. Um, first of all, I, I get the impression that you, maybe some others, are Kings fan. Kings are up by one at the end of three quarters. Woo! Uh, okay. Okay. Like the beat, like the beat. Um, so, you know, your, your book from 2001 to 15 mm -hmm. is right. Landfall. Yep. And she helped me out with the pronunciation beforehand, the La, La Perouse family. Mm -hmm. give, give me the real French pronunciation, if you would. His name was Jean, uh, Jean Francois de Gallo de La Perouse. But yeah, what she said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But it's such a, like, such a sweeping book. And I just wonder, you know, it's about this, this expedition of the French, I want to say late 1700s. Yep. Right? So I'd love to know, like, what it is about travel. I think of like Mario Puzo, some of his stuff, how he talks about, you know, the the sins that men, that the people do when they travel, this idea of like you're outside of yourself. I wonder what travel, this whole expedition around the world, allowed you to do with these characters. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, I mean, I've always felt like I didn't belong where, wherever I am, right? I was born in one country and then moved to another and have sort of not belonged in either place particularly. Um, and these people were, you know, all explorers, they leave home and then they sort of end up where they don't belong. And um, most of what was written about these guys has been very hate geographic, you know, like, oh, these wonderful Frenchmen who went all over the world, like studying science and all that. I mean, they did do that. And they also messed up in a lot of ways. And then, uh, spoiler, but they all died and, and <laughs> like, didn't come home. And, and so it just fascinated me, like the way, you, the messes you can get into. I gotta imagine you said, yeah, the research was fun? Yes. The, Question mark? No, 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 it was really fun. The book was just an excuse to keep going to the library. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you get to travel the world or part of the world as far as? I did, I went to France a couple times okay. to do research for the trip, yeah. Awesome, awesome, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Claire, great job and congratulations on that first round. Um, you talk about you know 30 years of firefighting, which is crazy because you're 28. I don't know. <laughs> Pay um, you later. Right? <laughs> but just uh, reading one of the interviews with you, you talk about like an infinite store of stories. I mean, I just made up that phrase. Sounds kind of cool, right? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wonder about like, were you able as you go through those 30 years, were you able to be an objective observer? Were you kind of just sitting back like, this is freaking cool, or was it like at the end you're like, oh. I need to kind of look back and, and tell those stories to people. Yeah, it, it was way more reflective than me. I had no intention of writing about fire. In fact, I, I wrote a whole manuscript when I retired that wasn't about fire. Um, but, but my agent wanted the one about fire. So <laughs> then, then I had to go, oh, I, I wish I would have paid closer attention and been an observer. <laughs> but, no, I was pretty in the moment and pretty, I mean, I was 17 and hell aware of is a 17 year old um, of greater scope of things. So, and, and then I was just sucked in, so. Is there like a, a culture with a capital C of like fire, like a fire department? Is there like a, you know, you think of like the police department, you know, I mean, any, any, sort of, any sort of business or job, like you feel like there's like a strong culture that you could like point out like what it means to be a firefighter? Oh, wow. Where's the intangible center? <laughs> um, I mean, yes. I mean, I my my peeps came tonight that were part of, of going through. We all went through it together. So it's kind of like um, war buddies, maybe, mm -hmm. and because you have to see horrific stuff and then just 
the wonderfulness of humanity during disaster and catastrophe. And it's, and it's a lot, so you, you go through it very much together. So it's, it's all caps, everything, CAL FIRE is all caps. <laughs> it, literally, that's, uh, that's how they spell it. So. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Likewise, uh, we've worked. We've worked uh, virtually. We did a, a reading, or he did a reading um, recently that we were part of. And uh, just you know, big fan of all four of you, and just in, in reading the research and stuff, and reading your book. I'd like to ask about uh, Sinsontle. Yeah, yeah. How's my pronunciation? Yeah, that's perfect. So this is your collection of poems. Yes, it right? is. And um, there's one poem. A lot of them have some really cool long titles. Mm -hmm. Right. What you can know is what you have made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so there's the there's that Latin term that you uh, give as a is verum factum principle. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, it's a quote from John Baptista of Okay. Yeah. So I want to get to the, so the the cool question I want to get to is did you or did you not go to a Halloween party dressed as the absence of Marcel? Yes I did. Can you tell us about that? The I absence did. of Marcel. Can you tell us about I went that? as the absence of myself or the shadow of myself. Okay. Um, I got a the like a, a those like skin suits. Okay. <laughs> And um, it kind of covered my whole face. Um, my wife went as me. She dressed up as me. <laughs> and so I was my boy following her around, doing what she did. And I never dedicated myself more than not talking for an entire night of Halloween. And nobody knew who I was. And I would just stand in the corner in like this just completely dark suit. Um, and the only time I would talk or like, yeah, you know, I had to go into the bathroom, take off my the, the whole mask and I breathe a little and then put it back on. And the dog knew who I was. The same or I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, the same, the same. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the only time I've been met up. Everything else has just been. I bet I was a hot dog last year. So. <laughs> well, you say like you know you know one of those skin suits. No, we don't know. Like, where would you get a skin suit? <laughs> it wasn't leather. <laughs> Those are too expensive. Okay. Like, I'm not but, what I'm getting to is you know, there's, there's a lot about memory, definitely, in, yeah. your, in your collection. Um, like how and why we remember what we do. Yeah. I mean, I guess as a writer, like, literally diction is what yeah. you do. You, you traffic in words. So I just wonder kind of like what, not, not to be that poem, but just your poetry in general has yeah. to say about, about memory. What we do remember, what we don't, and, and kind of how we remember it. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, pointing to that poem, which you can know is what you have made, named, is kind of part of that idea that um, I can know something if I can name it, and then the inverse of that is the you know the the colonial idea of, of or the like more Adamic principles of like if I can name it, I can own it, the, that that kind of violence. Um, but generally, being a poet, I think for me, um, uh, being able to name something that I didn't have the words for. Or at least get close, and that's you know with with metaphor. I, oh, it, 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 this is, this thing is like this other thing. You know, that's that's basically twenty four seven. Yeah. Do. So I mean, am I right that since since would be like that's from the Nahuatl? So it's like Nahua, yeah. if you put it in the English, it's a mockingbird. It's a mockingbird. It's a bird of four hundred line, four hundred tons. Um, and so yeah, like I can never get quite the right the kind of relationships that I wanted to describe. Um, so I guess it was trying to find a closest approximation. Uh -huh. Probably the next closest approximation would probably be a sculpture. If I could have been done it again, I'd probably be a sculpture. Uh, 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 I appreciate so. it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Anthony, thanks again for your uh, first round. I mean, uh, like you said, just, just reading from the iPad was an absolute heroic feat in itself. <laughs> and the storyline was so moving. And uh, yeah, between flush and between, I mean, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I had the chance to go to my, my high school's uh, theater today, high school drama. They did Clue. And it was, it was a very small venue. It was really up close. It was so cool to see my students you know, doing something they love. And I was just struck by how, like, how intimate theater is, right? One of the quotes from one of your interviews, you talked about, uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but like theater is the only or one of the only pure art forms. Yeah. What, what do you mean by it? How, how, what do you mean by that? There's, um, with movies, you have to, you're making them for people 
a wider audience. There's wider view viewership, so there's a lot more caution of the kind of content that kind of that comes out. Um, theater, and, and and you basically, uh, it just costs a subscription to to watch watch film theater. You have to go to it, and and um, and it costs a lot more money. You know, so I think theater, live theater, and the novel are two art forms that are still the, the only real pure expressions anymore as far as writing and storytelling, in my view, because you can you have more freedom. You can go deeper in, in theater. You don't even have to have a story. You just, it's, because we're watching the people do things that we in the audience cannot do, which is stand up there, learn all those lines, be vulnerable, cry, say something offensive, with a straight face, and then at the end, smile and applaud, and at the applause, you know. Um, movies can be manipulated, performance is manipulated. Um, people get Academy Award nominations and can win Academy Awards for basically the editing of their performance, <laughs> not the purity of their performance. And theater is an actor's medium. Um, the two creative people in the theater are the actor, the playwright. Everybody else's job is to honor that. So. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. I'll get you, Mike. Give me the hook in a second. We'll do the, uh, the, the, the lighting round, if we will. Maybe we'll just go left to right here. Uh, my left to right. Starting with Marcelo. Who, this question will be for all four. Um, who are some... On whose shoulders are you standing? Whether that's you know family, friends, you know particular writers, poets, whose literary shoulders or, or familial shoulders are you standing on? Uh, my first poetry teachers. Without them, I wouldn't have been here. I think one of them is here in the back. Stickers up! Stickers up! <laughs> A long line of writers, probably starting with Daniel Defoe. Robinson Crusoe, Shipwrecks, etc. Cormac McCarthy, um, director Paul Thomas Anderson, Spike Lee. My mom was a children's book author and illustrator, and that's how I learned to read and, and write. Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to the second round. Thank you. Pete has a very strong right shoulder, and uh, that's why we rely on him. Um, as the judges make their way uh, up for round two, I'll just tell you some. Actually, somebody uh, shout out your favorite author. <laughs> Nobody has ever read a book. Have you ever Googled an author and put him in? I heard T.S. Eliot. Uh, <laughs> I heard T.S. Eliot and uh, Margaret Atwood. T.S. Eliot uh, was afraid of cows. Um, Margaret Atwood uh, once heard a six word story that I absolutely love. It goes like this. Longed for him, got him, shit. <laughs> I mean, that's right. Uh, okay, the judges are back. I'm going to now introduce the second round readers. Are you ready for round two? <laughs> All right. He's author of The Children of the Land at NPR Best Book of the Year and a 2020 International Latino Book Award finalist, and Sinzante, winner of the 2019 GLCA New Writers Award and an NPR Best Book of 2018. You just saw him. You already love him. It's Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Sorry, Marcelo flew in and everything was going wrong, but he made it in time. Marcelo, if you stand here and just kind of hang out and look wonderful, uh, we're going to do a coin flip to decide who goes first. Uh, Marcelo's a puppet. She's the author of Landfalls, long listed for the Center, of, Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award. She's won a Pushcart Prize, was a Best American Short Stories honorable mention, and has appeared in Zoetrope All Story, One Story, and the Gettysburg Review, three of my favorite literary journals. Go nuts for Naomi J. Williams! Naomi J. Williams! 
Man, just to uh, not confuse Marcelo uh, more than we already have by throwing him on stage in this way, uh, I'm going to have you call the coin flip in the air. Uh, first is Gertrude Stein on Ezra Pound, who was a fascist. Anyway, uh, she said this about him. A village explainer. Excellent if you were a village, but if not, not. <laughs> such a deep burn, and she was real good. Uh, and then F. Scott Fitzgerald said this about Ernest Hemingway. He's always willing to lend a helping hand to the ones above him. <laughs> oh, All right, Naomi, which one is gonna be his? It's incorrect, it's F. Scott Fitzgerald on top. That means, Marcella, you get to choose. Would you like to read first or second in the second one? One right, second. Marcella will wander that way. I will wander off. And then we are going to. Oh, she's going to set up. Um, so did, I heard. Who are your favorite authors again? I heard Sylvia Plath. Uh, Sylvia Plath. Uh, Sylvia Plath was um, once drunk. Uh, was once drinking on a date. She went on 67 dates in 60. Wait, six, 67 dates in 65 dates. It doesn't matter. It was like 69 dates and 67 dates, or it really is not irrelevant, but I'm waiting for it to take in my brain correctly. Um, anyway, she went on a ton of dates in the summer of 1949. She was out there doing her thing. And uh, one time she was on a date with a man and uh, just uh, was drinking uh, Whiskey Max and just stood up and left. Um, and then she, she decided, oh, I'm just gonna go to this literary magazine party. Oh, are you ready? She's not ready, okay. Okay, I trust you. Well, it's, yeah, it'll align well with the story. If you're ready, I, okay, great, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, I, there's nothing but punchlines. <laughs> just if you're, it's a, a beautiful story about Sylvia Plath, just don't Google what happened. And I'll tell you the rest if, if uh, we have time. All right, you ready? Well, it's not sure you are. Should dive off head first the moment the shocking image comes on. It's heating up. So anyway. <laughs> so she goes to this party as soon as the image shows up, I'll cut off. Um, she goes to this uh, literary magazine party. She's left today. She's so drunk she's just falling into trees. And she gets the party. She's there I wrote a piece for you inspired by this famous woodblock print, a shunga, an erotic picture from 1814 by the famous artist Hokusai. So I'm part Japanese, so you're not gonna read, you're not gonna hear anything about French anything. Okay, so <laughs> about this. This image in English is called The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. My piece is called The Fisherman's Wife Has Something to Say. <laughs> First of all, I'm not a fisherman's wife, so stop calling me that. I'm not even married. Second, it wasn't a dream, but I'll get to that in a second. Hokusai son didn't name his image, but we call it Tako to Ama. Tako, octopus. Or octopuses. We're less hung up on distinguishing between one and more than one of something. Ama means diver. For thousands of years, we've dived my mother and grandmothers and their mothers and grandmothers before them. On a good day, we return with buckets lined with oysters and abalone and sea cucumber, enough to exchange for rice and wine, maybe fabric, a packet of needles. On less good days, which happens more often as the world and its oceans grow tired, we return with only enough to feed ourselves. What we really want, of course, are pearls. That's the dream to steam or force open an oyster and find, resting on that quivering muscular bed, one, or more than one, lustrous, nacreous, valuable sphere. Today, the women who dive for tourists wear modest white uniforms. In my day, we wore just headscarves and loincloths, both of which I seem to have lost during this encounter. <laughs> anyway, there's nothing about marriage or fishermen. That's some Western invention. Art critics who couldn't read the text, lots of text, even thought this was a rape scene. Some surmised that the two cephalopods were messing with a drowned woman 
And then they called it the dream of the fisherman's wife. But it wasn't a dream. One morning I swam away from my mother and aunts toward an oyster bed they forbade me from visiting because they said it was guarded by a giant octopus. And they were right. I'd collected 10 lovely promising specimens when suddenly the octopus was before me, crimson with fury, tentacles flaring. I launched myself up and away, only to surface on a roiling gray sea, quite alone, no sign of our boat or the other women. While I was underwater, a squall had blown through. Even my bamboo bucket was gone. Everyone assumes the octopus was male, even Hokusai's son. He thought this smaller creature was its son, which, you know, was a little weird. <laughs> I think it might have been a different kind of mollusk altogether. Or they might have been a pair, these two, but not father and son. A mating pair, male and female, exhibiting the remarkable sexual size dimorphism some species are known for, and perhaps a desire to spice up an old partnership. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about any of that at the time, of course. I was treading water, hopelessly scanning the horizon, when the giant octopus appeared beside me and curled a tentacle around my hand. I surrendered my oysters and expected to die, but the creature pushed me gently toward shore, supporting me with its many arms when I grew tired, and helped me up onto a rocky beach, soft and slick with seagrass. As I lay there catching my breath, amazed to be alive, the octopus pried open my oysters one by one and slurped down the meat sharing a few with its wingman. But first it held out each breached bi bivalve for me to see, as if showing me there were no pearls inside for me to regret. Hokusai san was a marvelous artist, but a bad erotica writer. <laughs> he scrawled all this noisy, silly dialogue. I'm not gonna translate. But at one point the octopus says, are, are, fukure you know you no aieki, nura, nura, doku, doku. <laughs> And I supposedly go, we're supposed to be the masters of onomatopoeia. It's all right, the artist can't know everything. Here's something else he didn't know. How the octopus reached up inside me until I thought I would break open, then withdrew its miraculous tentacle, shooed the little guy away from my mouth, teased open my lips, and dropped a large, perfect pearl between my teeth. It tasted of the sea. It tasted of desire. And I could have sold it and lived in comfort the rest of my life. But I didn't. I kept diving, and I kept the pearl, a reminder that the finer treasures lie within, and the finest lovers know how to bring out the best in you. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't think to drop a flask. Uh, amazing, thank you so much. And now, time for your final reader tonight. Put your hands together for Marcelo! thing on me filled with panic and thirst. At last, you opened my eyes and said, look at me, look at me, goddammit. So I did. Neither of us knew what we wanted, but would do anything to have it. You said, I want to believe it is art, even if we don't change. We took off our clothes and fucked each other in front of our friends. We wanted them to watch and throw flowers at us. We wanted to be angry at something that we could name. I ran through the streets yelling, get it while it's hot. You kept predicting the future. 
it was something like this. Our friends applauded. We bowed. The judges asked to see it again, but we didn't know how, so we burned the fields and the cattle died. In the end, what did I know about touching a man with the same hands I used to, touch, to cut grapes? What did I know about touching a woman? Have we barely begun our departure? Dear judges, none of you can imagine the incredible amount of money it costs to be poor. And just a second, Dulce. I will gather the voices of strangers mouthing my name. We are painting our names on each other, colorful tattoos pushing our lungs to the other shores of our bones. If I could make honey, I would lie prostrate before the thief broken in half. Ribbons as the wound hurries to heal. We're never in much of a hurry. It's easy to make honey from what is beautiful and what is not. Let's imagine we live in the suburbs and call off the babysitter. It is summer and I hardly know you. One, I will eat everything I love from its edge to its center. If it has an edge, if it has a center. Two, we make friends and lose them. Three, we never bake another goddamn pie again. Either way, it's a terrible future. It's a movie where no one seems interested in the ending. I boil water on the stove for tea. I am alone in the house. I think about the cock that's never been in my mouth to shred this kind of quiet and piece it together again. And now we go to the judges. We're going to start with Robert, who's going to speak about Naomi's literary merit. First and foremost, it's unfair that I have to start this every time. <laughs> My critique. I love the switch you did with the dream of the fisherman's wife and, and moving it around because you were changing the story as the story moved forward. It constantly kept rounding and rounding and rounding and going in the directions that you didn't expect. One of the things of a very good writer, and you are a very good writer, is to be able to continue with a metaphor with a, uh, an object and never let that object go and then actually do something with it. You know, pearls, we all know the pearl, right? Pearls mean so much, but you were able to take it and then make it disappear at the end. And that was the power of what you were writing there in the, the powerful way that you talked about the lovers and uh, that lovers know what to bring to you. Um, you didn't chicken out when it came to the tentacles. Uh, most writers would have chickened out. You didn't do it, okay? And it wasn't erotic, but it was very, very, and forgive me for this, feminine. It got at the heart of a woman and I heard something I hadn't heard before. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. When it comes to performance, way to foreshadow what we were in for just by what you chose to wear tonight. Um, I mean, from the pearls to the octopus. At first, I was like, are we in for a PowerPoint presentation? This is interesting. Um, but wow, what a great surprise. I mean, and I agree uh, with President Nelson in that it wasn't erotic, it was empowering. Um, and I love 
how your cadence and your rhythm and your projection really captured the empowering nature of what you wrote. Thank you very much, Vicki. All right, Miss Nate Omi. First of all, my first, you just have this spicy vibe to you and I love it. Um, you're, you're very tenacious. The way you jumped off this stage, I said, oh, I need her knees. You jumped off the stage so fast. Um, you didn't give up when the, uh, the projector wasn't coming on. You didn't give up on that. At one point, your laptop fell asleep. You woke that back up and got right back into it. So you're a little, you're very, very, not little, you're a very spicy, tenacious, young, vibrant thing. Um, also, who would have thought that, um, for me, my thought process was, um, who would have thought that an octopus could, could sound so sexy? You made it sound very, very sexy, and you were not afraid to release your inhibition. So with that being said, that's my song for you. Release your inhibitions, feel the rain on your skin. No one else can feel it for you, only you can let it in. Thank you so much. And now, over to Robert. Speaking about Marcello, who's literary man? Marcello. As you were reading, instead of writing down um, something that I wanted to say, I wrote down your lines. That is powerful. I wrote down, want to be angry at something that can be named. Haven't every one of us wanted to be angry at something that can be named when we just feel the anger? And, and you captured that, painting our names on each other, if it has an edge. It is so difficult to write in first person, so difficult to be able to be another persona. And the power of what you did was that in the two different pieces, the eye was not the same eye. That is a sign of a writer who is mature and a writer who is able to in be and embody someone else and feel someone else's feelings. So congratulations. I got to agree with President Nelson. It was difficult for me to write something because I was just hanging on every word that you said, um, especially like an incredible cost of money to be poor. And at first, you know, I'm focusing on performance, right? And you're wearing all black. And I also listened to the intermission of your Halloween costume. Um, but it's so fitting, right? Because you just allowed your physical self to just be a vessel and to let your words take over and to feel the passion and the yearning and the heart. And um, it, was, it was really remarkable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so Marcelo. <laughs> um, you have a very complex, intriguing vibe, and it, it I, I don't know, I can only speak for myself, but it left me wanting more, and I don't know if that was the actual words or if it was your vibe, I don't know. Um, but, you know, a part of the story when you were saying, you know, doing it in front of your friends, you just had no fear about that, and then you mentioned that the judges wanted to see it again. I don't know, I'm still undecided. Do y'all want to see it again? <laughs> I don't know, but it was just very, very intriguing and a little crazy, maybe. Um, I did count about 57 adjectives, which I thought was amazing, just in that short piece. So with all of that, with it being a little all over the place, but still wanting more, my song for you is Crazy by Niles Barkley. Does that make me crazy? Does that make me crazy? Does that make me crazy? Possibly. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you so much. Once again, the judges are going to huddle amongst themselves and make an impossible decision. It's one of my favorite things in literary deathmatch when you see the first reader and you're like, well, they've got this in the bag. And the second reader, you're like, oh, wait a second. And it's happened twice then. And I love that. Uh, so the judges will huddle amongst themselves, make tonight's second impossible decision on who will advance to the finals. And before I say another word, give it up. For Marcelo and Naomi, what a round! Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. So, I am very excited to share what I'm about to tell you. In 1989, uh, Amy, a seven-year-old girl, sent a fan letter to Roll Dahl, and what she sent him was one of her dreams in a bottle. And what that was is just oil, glitter, and colored water, right? And on the 10th of February, 1989, Roald Dahl wrote this letter back to Amy. So I'm gonna read you the letter. It's not funny, it's, it's uh, yeah, I'll let you experience it as you will. Dear Amy, I must write a special letter and thank you for the dream and the bottle. You are the first person in the world who has sent me one of these and it intrigued me very much. I also like the dream. Tonight I shall go down to the village and blow it through the bedroom window of some sleeping child and see if it works. With love, roll down. Wow, like that is amazing. Um, but here's where it gets wild. So I found this letter uh, in uh, 2017, I think. You know, and I just thought this is such a beautiful letter, and I've, I've read it at literary death matches. But during the pandemic, we weren't doing shows, and I found ways to fill my time. So I was like, let me see if this Amy is real, right? Like, I'm just gonna try to find Amy. It was like a two-month thing, and it started kind of fun, and then on Twitter, and being like, hey, this is... here's what's wild. Amy lives in Davis, California. <laughs> tonight is her 41st birthday, and she is here tonight, and I said, if we cheer for you loud enough, will you come up to the stage so we can all give it up for Amy? Amy, come on up! Come on, Amy! Don't be afraid! Embarrassing. You guys are suckers. But wouldn't that have been amazing? I mean, it would have been great, right? That would have been a moment. And it kind of is anyway. We felt it. Uh, so I apologize, but also I love that that just happened. Uh, okay. uh, we're going to go to our judges. Uh, Robert, I feel like you're eager to uh, say a few words and announce the night's second finalist. I feel like you're eager. That's the face of it. Is there any pace of speech? that is in more oppositional to me speaking, blah, 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 and Robert saying just genius things very quietly and eloquently. I'm, gonna, I'm learning many lessons tonight. Uh, okay. You know, you, you're making, we decided she was going to oh. do it. Okay, but, you know. She can. <laughs> this, this one was incredibly hard because you got two writers that are um, really focused on individuals, on bringing individuals to life, on really giving us the inner souls of individuals. And, and that was incredibly powerful in both artists. Uh, Marcella, you're gonna be a poet that is going to be renowned all over the place, okay? You, you got the touch of being able to use language and you know how to repeat words. That's one of the hardest things to do, to know how to build them in and repeat them so that they become symbols. You do that marvelously. Naomi, you tore into our souls. You really made us see something that we had not seen before. And we've chosen you because of that. Because we looked at a picture and we saw something, and it wasn't the image that was really important. It was the way that that young girl came alive in the story and found her own soul. And that was incredibly powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Come up today, And one more time for my Like, okay, are you ready to go cookie rage? Just devour as many cookies as possible? No, we're now on to the finale. So the way we do the finale is we play a vaguely literary game. We played Pin the Mustache on Hemingway before, <laughs> author spelling bees with complicated author names. But uh, tonight we're gonna do something, again, that I haven't done in seven years. Uh, if we can have all the writers come up, starting with Claire and Naomi, our finalists, and they're gonna be followed by Anthony Marcello. Uh, and we're gonna play a game. I'm not gonna tell you what it is just yet. Uh, could I get one volunteer from the audience? Will somebody join? Who's brilliant? Yes, you, the brilliant person with their hand up. If you could make your way to the stage. Uh, An Anthony and Marcello, definitely come up. You're part of this uh, shenaniganry. And uh, this, I, you seem to be now dancing. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You were the person uh, who yelled out an author name, and that's when the Silly Sylvie Plus story started. Okay, so tonight we're gonna do a game. What's your name? Aiden. Aiden. Fantastic. Uh, we're gonna do a game called uh, Lone Star Lit, um, or One Star Wonder, depending where we're at. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read one star Amazon book reviews, and the teams have to figure out what book I'm talking about. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do we've got a thousand, and we're gonna you know it's gonna take about six hours, but we're gonna get there. Uh, but first, we need to pick teams. So, um, Claire, I find the first round uh, harder to win than the second just because you're thrown into the fire. So I'm going to have you give, get the first overall draft pick. You can pick anybody on this stage, including Aiden, who's uh, very shyly standing in the dark. But he, he will become a star at some point of this show. Uh, so who would you like to be on your team? Yeah, you can pick anybody but myself or Naomi. Nikisha, great choice, great choice. Okay, Claire, if you could go that way, and that means Naomi, this would be your half of the stage. Naomi, you get to pick two. We're doing snake ladder draft style, it'd be a uh, uh, fantasy draft style. Uh, who would you like? Two of these people. Well, I definitely want more solo. Great call. Um, yeah, and, and I, I would like the president um, campaign. Genius choice. If you could uh, join Naomi on this side of the stage, Robert. Now, Claire, it's your turn to take two people. Um, Vicky remains, Aiden remains, and Anthony remains. Great, Anthony and Vicky. Aiden came up here to be the final round pick. Happened to him as a child, that's why he's so handsome and strong now. Uh, Aiden, you're gonna be joining uh, Team Naomi. Now, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna bring this buzzer, excuse me one second. I'm gonna bring this buzzer to the center stage. This is a professionally created um, buzzer that we had uh, custom made, um, which looks like this. And what's gonna happen, I'm gonna read these one star, star Amazon book reviews. Team Claire, at any point, one of you can buzz in if you know the name of the book that I'm referencing, and then Team Naomi, you can uh, chime in and, I like that they're sitting, they're just like, we'll get up to buzz in when we get up to buzz in. <laughs> it's a small stage, but I'm gonna have, maybe if your team can sort of populate this side of the stage, uh, and you can, you can confirm, or confer, or confirm, but once you buzz in and you say the name of the book, uh, then your answer is official. Um, and we're gonna, let's see, I'll give you an example. Uh, these are bad examples because these are ones we don't use, but uh, here's one. So, this is for Naked Lunch, I'm just going to split it. So, heroin sounds rather unpleasant, so it's of that nature. I will say if you listen to the full answer, you're probably going to uh, get more hints. But maybe not, okay. Do you understand it all was happening? Well enough. Okay, great. You guys? Team in? Okay. Don't trip on this. Here we go. Does anybody out there understand? It doesn't matter. Go figure it out. Okay. For one point, too nautical for me. Yes. Is it Moby Dick? It is Moby Dick. Look at that. One point. That's so many. Fantastic. Man, we're not messing up. All right. For two points, a story about a. a I'm sorry. Two points. A story about a psychotic, sadistic, child hating man child with a penchant for third world labor. Willy Wonka can suck it. Yes. Jane Austen? It is not Jane Austen. Uh, I'm just going to reread the last line. You guys have already answered, so I'm going to reread the last line for you. Willy Wonka can suck it. I'm going to read the whole thing. I feel like you guys are going to like, what's happening? A story about a psychotic, sadistic, child hating man child with a penchant for third world labor. Willy Wonka can suck it. You have uh, five seconds. Five. Four. Correct! Two points! They nailed it! They're so close to Jane Austen. I felt like, which Jane Austen book? I'm like Prime Prejudice. They were both, it's all child labor in that one. I understand, I appreciate that. Okay, two to one. This one's for three points. Here's the first half of the book. We had dinner and a few drinks. We went to a cafe and talked and had some drinks. We ate dinner and had a few drinks. Dinner, drinks, more dinner, more drinks. We took a cab here or there in Paris and had some drinks and maybe we danced and flirted and talked shit about somebody. More dinner, more drinks, I love you, I hate you. Maybe you should come up to my room, no you can't. I flipped through the second half of the book a day or two late, yes. <laughs> the Great Gatsby is incorrect, but I'll let you listen to the rest of it. Um, 
I flipped through the second half of the book a day or two later and saw the words dinner and drinks on nearly every page and figured it wasn't worth the risk. This is a very difficult one, but I just love that somebody took the time to write that entire thing and aren't wrong. Here we go. Yeah, hit the buzzer just for fun. Jane Austen. Is it Hemingway? It is Hemingway. Do you know the book? Um, uh, the Sun Also Rises. That is correct! <laughs> Team Naomi, now up four points to two. All right, this one's for four points. It's a play. We wanted Anthony to be able to nail it easily. Uh, no, it's just a play. Okay. Ready, set, here we go. What I got out of it was listen to women more often and you don't end up with a, having a ton of guys stab you to death. Whoa. Yes. Is this Julius Caesar? It is Julius Caesar! Holy cow. It is now eight to one. Don't give up, Claire. You've still got a shot. You have two. We almost detected one for no reason. Except I can't go. Uh, okay. This one is for five points. We're getting close to the end, so. Okay, five minutes. One, I'm bored. Two, he uses too many allusions to other novels so that if you're not well read, this book makes no sense. Three, most American readers are not fluent in French, so to have conversations or in a, yes. It's Henry James. That is incorrect. Oh. An opening for Team Claire, here we go. <laughs> So to have conversations or interjections in French with no translation is plain dumb. Four, did I mention I was bored? Five, also to sum it up, it's a story about a pedophile. Oh. <laughs> Do you know this Nabokov book? <laughs> yes, Lolita. Lolita is correct! <laughs> Anthony Mild, I know this Nabokov book, and, it, and it, that's why I said that part. Okay. It is now eight to six. This one is worth two. Eight to seven. I have no idea what the story is, so I'm just saying numbers and hoping for the best. This next one is worth one point. Now, if Team Claire gets it right, we'll go to sudden death. If Team Naomi gets it, she'll be crowned literary death match. Sacramento one, episode one champion. Now. Before I say, uh, before we get to the, fi the final final, I just want to uh, thank you all for coming. You could have done something else tonight. <laughs> you could have done a lot of other things, but there's a specific thing you could have done. And I just think it's extraordinary that you came here, you filled up this room, you supported stories on Stage Sacramento. That's, it, they're an incredible organization. I want to thank Joshua and Jeff for being so amazing to work and your time. Um, I want to thank uh, Pete Real for the Chills at Will podcast. Definitely subscribe. It will cost you nothing, and it will make everybody happy. Um, and uh, basically, there's a there's a book option outside. Buy books. Honestly, it's the one thing we can do to say fuck you, Florida. Uh, <laughs> is there, there just goes in libraries and then people share books. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's my, that's a pretty good pitch. You know what I was gonna say? Okay, for one point in the Literary Deadmatch Championship, or you wonder what they win, right? And I haven't told you. So they win Literary Immortality and this medal in my pocket, which is worth seven dollars. Uh, and it's engraved. It says uh, cool engraved stuff. Okay, here we go. For one point, this was a children's book. At some point, the tree should have started singing Janet Jackson's one of you. <laughs> I'm just gonna read the rest of it and then tell you if that's true. What have you done for me lately in dropping apples on the human, human's head? It is, by Shel Silverstein, it is the giving tree. Ladies and gentlemen, Naomi Williams is a literary deadline champion! It comes at an important time. We have the BAME. So I wanted to, uh, I guess, anoint you 
uh, Sacramento goddess of literary arts, and I'm going to hand you this lightsaber to do whatever you want with. Uh, before we finish, I just want to declare, you came on like a house of fire. You beat the unbeatable Anthony Jawad. I, I checked the bet 365, and it was it was neck and neck, and you, you managed to win that first round with an incredible piece. You now stand before us so close to a literary dead match championship. How do you feel? <laughs> I would not know what to do with the saber, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck for Team Claire. Round two, one of the greatest rounds in literary dead match history, Marcelo. You won by, I talked to the judges at length, you won by the closest vote. You won by 0.007% of the vote. Um, <laughs> never seen that before in literary uh, history. And now you stand before us as a champion. What does this mean to your literary career? I think it might finally jumpstart it, you know? Give it up for Team Naomi. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. I don't know where we're going after this. I forgot to find out. But let's all go have a drink or eat a cookie and stand in a parking lot. And just, if you if you can't afford to buy a book, at least tell all these writers that you love. Tell them that you thought they were fantastic. They will very much appreciate it. If you do buy a book, they will sign your book. And then, uh, Florida. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you again for coming and call your mother. She misses you.